I've written a, a book which is uh, a, essentially a critique of, of uh, British journalism over a period of 100 years. Now, that's a hell of a lot of journalism, as you can imagine. It took me rather a long time to research and uh, rather too long, in fact, where's my publisher, to write um, so that we, we, uh, I missed uh, at least one, probably more deadlines, because it is a, it is a lengthy, very lengthy subject and needs and deserves a, a, a decent amount of attention. Um, over a hundred years, you, I mean, that's a really good test bed. I, that's a clear, you get a very, very clear view of a nation's um, means of, of informing itself. And I think really quite a, it's, it, it, it was interesting. I mean, I wasn't expecting to find that a century would be quite quite such a, a useful kind of period. You know, you, you, you've got to choose a period, and so you say 100 years, um, uh, uh, certainly when you're writing out the proposal and before you've worked out how much work that's going to involve, you think, yeah, 100 years, that's fine. What was fascinating to me, well, various things were interesting, but one of the things that was fascinating was um, how, how cyclical it is, how, 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 how much uh, the journalism of ninety of the year nineteen hundred was very very similar to the journalism of the year two thousand. How very much the same kind of people were writing about recognizably the same sort of of subject. Clearly, I mean, a hundred years uh, in social and political history is a long is a long time, and things change uh, dramatically. Of course. Nevertheless, there was a, a, a unity of approach which I found uh, really, really interesting. And I came to the conclusion, apart from anything else, that the, the, particularly the journalists I rather liked, uh, of whom there were, there were some, um, not, a, not a huge number necessarily, but, but some. I would think particularly of, of Philip Gibbs, who was one of the uh, what we would now, I suppose, call embedded journalists in the First World War, a group of very small group of people, maybe half a dozen at any given time, who were are, who are, uh, allowed some sort of access to the Western Front and uh, often pumped up with, uh, with uh, wholly, wholly inaccurate information, allowed to go more or less where they wanted, but not allowed necessarily to write everything that they wanted. And Philip Gibbs was a very charming and doubt-racked man quite early on uh, in the in the uh, in the first world war he realized that this was not this was not what he was being told it was that it was a very different sort of war and that there was there were uh, real there was real suffering and and that it was becoming wholly unacceptable and his ways of reaching out, trying to tell you this in his reports, which he knew would be censored if he even hinted at what his real meaning was, um, yeah, I, th I find very, very attractive indeed. In the end, uh, he uh, had the courage uh, only to address a dinner in his honor, which was given, I think, in early in 1917, as far as I remember. Um, of which all sorts of grandees uh, turned up. I mean, many leading military people, but also the Prime Minister, Lloyd George, and lots and lots of other government people. Private dinner, um, not, of course, reported, um, but at which he just told them what was going on, how dreadful it was, and how bad it was, how wrong it was. And it, it shocked everybody, and no surprise, absolutely nothing changed. And... Um, I, I compare him in the book with a man called, whose name I can't actually remember because it's a, it's a, it's a complex double-barreled name, Ellis something something, and I always forget it. And I'm, forgive me, I forgot to write it down now. But he, he also was another one of these embedded correspondents. But he was so embedded, he was the only correspondent, uh, to, or certainly the only, the only British correspondent, to be at the Dardanelles. And uh, he wrote for just about everybody there, from, from the, the, the Daily Mirror to the, to the Daily uh, uh, Telegraph. And um, 
Uh, Ellis, whatever his name was, um, uh, was uh, really early on quite quite in favor of the whole thing, charmed as everybody was by the general in command, General Hamilton, and slowly came to realize this whole thing was an utter disaster, that people's lives, men's lives were just being thrown away without any care at all uh, in the most pointless and unwinnable conflict. And um, he started to write about it. Well, naturally, the, of course, the, the, uh, um, um, the, the uh, censors went absolutely berserk. And, but he was a man with a great kind of sense of himself. He was a military man to start off with. That's how he got the job in the first place, rather than a, a sort of standard journalist. And he simply um, decided that, all right, if he, couldn't, uh, if he couldn't write it in the newspapers, and he was going to go back to London, and he was going to tell everybody he possibly could in London uh, what was going on from the prime minister down. And he did. The prime minister at that stage uh, not being, um, uh, not being um, um, uh, Lloyd George, but being Asquith at that stage. And, and uh, so he went back, and he told them all about it. And he did something very clever, which got around the censor censorship, which was otherwise very fierce. But, but one thing that wasn't censored was interviews, for reasons I don't quite understand. Under the appalling uh, um, uh, Defense of the Realm Act, DORA, uh, you, could, you could interview somebody and you could report everything they said. And uh, he used this, I think possibly for the first time, uh, to say precisely what he thought about about the uh, the Dardanelles campaign, and it came out, and it was it was properly published as he said it, and the result was that the Dardanelles campaign came to a very quick and actually rather successful end. That the government realised that it was out in the public domain, and that people wouldn't stand for this kind of of, of slaughter, especially. Uh, somewhere that was not absolutely crucial to the to the to the war effort, um, and the withdrawal, which was, as I say, remarkably successful, began and and happened, and the Dardanelles campaign was, as it were, folded up and put in the drawer and finished finished with, and tens of thousands, perhaps more, lives were saved uh, as a result. I thought very interesting comparison between Philip Gibbs, the tortured chap who did everything he could to tell people within, as it were, the system by, by simply um, uh, going through, the, going through the, the censorship, but nevertheless um, trying to shove uh, as much uh, information kind of under the door uh, as he could get away with, and then goes and tells the prime minister, but only in private, uh, and, and uh, nothing comes of it. But at least I suppose his conscience was clearer, and and Ellis, I, this is appalling. You couldn't pass me a Ashmead Bartlett. Ashmead Bartlett. Thank you. See, it <laughs> takes my takes my my editor to uh, to remember. It's gone out of my mind long ago. I have problems remembering the years of the First World War, let alone the names of correspondents there. Um, Ellis Ashmead Bartlett. And Ellis Ashmead Bartlett actually did something really effective. And it, I mean, I, it's one of those sort of might have been. Supposing instead of having Philip Gibbs uh, as one of the main correspondents in the, in the, in the, on the Western Front, supposing Ellis Ashmead Bartlett had been, had been there, what might he have done? Very, very interesting, I think. And those sort of people you can really identify with. There was, however, and I'm, I'll, I'll stop in a moment and take questions, but there was, however, an appalling character, quite, quite sort of ludicrously, comically appalling character called William Beach Thomas, who may, may have been, it's been suggested by Peter Stoddart, Peter Stoddart, formerly editor of the Times, among others, uh, that that uh, he he might have been the um, or, or originator the uh, the original figure around on whom um, William Boot in Scoop was based a sort of simple minded um, innocent stumbling into into serious things and uh, screwing everything up as he went um, he worked for the Daily Mail uh, and he was absolutely appalling. 
all his reporting was about him, what he had done today, where he had been, the suffering he had seen, the courage he had seen. It gives the impression that from time to time, you know, probably not beyond uh, picking up a rifle and capturing the, a, a trench or two opposite. You know, there's all that sort of sense of, of, uh, of him. He was lampooned absolutely wonderfully in the, the, the great trench newspaper. I do recommend anybody interested in the state of journalism to look at the Wipers Times, not long ago collected and, and edited with a, an introduction um, by, by Ian Hislop of, of Private Eye, because it was the private eye of the front line and, and marvelous. I mean, terribly dated, all the jokes incredibly dated, but with a, a sort of amusing spirit that just makes you feel good about humanity and that under those awful conditions they could. And they called him Teach Bombers, and they, they loved having uh, little um, squibs about him which, um, in fact, in many ways was so similar to what Beach Thomas himself was writing that, that I think you could slip the one into the other and not notice. Um, and the difference between two men who took this thing incredibly seriously, one of whom was prepared to really go all out in order to try to get changes, and the other man who simply talked about how fantastic uh, the British fighting spirit was and how they leapt up with a laugh on their faces and went and stabbed the enemy on the other side with their bayonets uh, was, remar was absolutely remarkable. I once did an interview long ago in the 1970s, which parts of which I've quoted, in fact, with, with an aged relative of mine who was both at the Battle of the Somme and at the Battle of Passchendaele. And he told me, and I confirmed it later with others, that the Daily Mail um, uh, reporters, by which he meant, I think, just Beach Thomas, were forbidden to go to the front line for their own safety because they, the soldiers hated them so much that they would have killed him. He's in this, this old relative of mine, so they, they had, uh, they had an, um, uh, one, of his, uh, uh, one of his articles pinned up on the, on the wall with a sign that said, if this bastard comes here, shoot him. Um, <laughs> why? Because uh, uh, you would think that uh, that Beach Thomas, always praising the British soldiers to the heights, would uh, would would be to their to their you know they'd actually like something like that, but no, they felt that they they were being traduced. They felt that they they were they were amazingly brave those men, and they were willing to do the most appalling things, but they didn't want it to get out of out of kilter in some way. They wanted to be seen for what they were. That was to say, men de absolutely determined to do a job even if it cost them their lives. But they didn't want to be regarded as some kind of mad, loony characters that leapt up with a smile on their lips and loved to go and kill Germans because that wasn't what they wanted to do. And my other two, my two, the, the two heroes, I think, Philip Gibbs and, and Elid, Ellis Ashmead Bartlett, um, realized the, the truth of the fighting man and had got the respect there in the, in the First World War. That is a, sim a, little, a little, very small little uh, chunk uh, uh, out of my book, not more than a few pages, but I, it, it's something that, that meant quite a lot to me because it seems to me that the importance, it's a, it, my book is really a, a kind of, of, of uh, a, a pray of peon of praise to um, to report to the art of reporting of 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 writing of going to see what's happening and writing about it as honestly as you can there aren't that many people who behaved that well alas in this 600 page book um, a lot of journalists in a hundred years as you might imagine uh, were, 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 didn't do the job uh, as it should have been done, lied sometimes, uh, deliberately lied sometimes, sometimes more often than not got it wrong, simply failed to understand what was going on. But there are again and again and again, there are people that realize what the truth was and told it as best they could. And um, among them, they came from newspapers you might not otherwise expect. Um, 
the truth about the, 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 the murders car being carried out, revenge murders being carried out by, by the British Army and by uh, the Black and Tans in Ireland, for instance, after 1916, was uh, told to the British public by um, uh, somebody from the Daily Mail, uh, a newspaper which, is, which was, if anything, more uh, determinedly uh, uh, patriotic and uh, less connected to the truth even than it is today. Um, the, uh, the best of the, of the correspondence in, in Germany after the rise of Hitler uh, was the man from the Daily Express uh, who was absolutely, who just simply went around Germany for a fairly short time, as you can imagine, before he got slung out of the country telling people what was really going on, what was really happening to, to, to Jews in 1933, 1934. As I say, he got slung out quite quickly. But the, the Express, of all papers, uh, then took it upon itself to start a campaign against Hitler and always trying to report um, the, the, the daily events in, in, in Germany on the, uh, as it were, on the ground. I mean, what was happening to ordinary people under under um, under Hitler, whereas uh, all the other newspapers, including the the ones to the left who had correspondence there, um, tended to well wrote about simply the um, the 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 kind of uh, official life of Germany, as it were. What what Hitler has said today, the new in, the new rules that have been introduced today. Uh, the the um, the degree to which that they're being put into into uh, effect, but kept their heads down as journalists so often do in difficult places in order not to get not to get chucked out. But um, uh, Pembroke Phillips, uh, Pembroke Stevens, this uh, uh, this correspondent from the um, from the the Express, did the did the decent thing, and there were there were there are these characters through the book who just make you feel, thank God, somebody was doing a decent job. And the last thing I'll say before let, let, let's go to questions is that um, newspapers uh, overall, and I feel now having read so many yellowing bits of paper and, uh, um, and, and transcripts under, under often actually rather difficult conditions because I had to do my own uh, work for the BBC uh, uh, while I was uh, um, writing it. Um, but I, I feel that I've, I can make a certain, I'm in a position to make a certain sort of judgment. And there are two newspapers over the, over the century which, which stand out as, uh, represented, as representing the, what we believe now to be the truth about what happened more often than any other. One of those is the Daily Telegraph, and the other is the, the Guardian, formerly the Manchester Guardian, for more than half the, 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 the century. Um, and both of them have one thing in common, uh, a lack of proprietorial uh, um, interference. The, the Daily Telegraph, although owned by a, 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 a grandee, uh, a, a sort of the Berry family, very kind of grand and so forth, nevertheless had a tradition which Last or even to this day, apparently, uh, well, let's hope so, uh, under the Barclay brothers, completely different uh, set of managers, but a tradition of not uh, interfering with the day-by-day day day reporting and the day-by-day day setting of editorial lines and so forth, but would appoint, would appoint an editor and then say to him, OK, get on with it, and as long as you make a profit and uh, don't cause a scandal, uh, you know, I'll back you. And The Guardian, uh, not owned by an individual, but, uh, but owned and, and run by a trust, uh, which equally didn't, didn't interfere uh, with, with the day-to-day -day running of the paper. And it's hard when you look back at the tradition of proprietorial interference, starting with the ineffable Harmsworth brothers uh, in, in, in 1899, 1900, and running right through now to the, I would say, equally ineffable R R Rupert Murdoch, um, to, uh, to see what happens when you've got a, a, a what happens to basic uh, um, honest reporting when you've got a proprietor that isn't interested in that kind of stuff and just simply wants a finished product 
that he will like and he will uh, feel is, uh, suits his ideas. Um, during that time, uh, the best newspaper in terms of quality was probably um, uh, the, the Sunday Times, I think, under Harold Evans, uh, bought, of course, by Rupert Murdoch. But in Murdoch's defense, uh, although why I, I should be making this point is not clear to me, um, <laughs> you have to say that if he hadn't uh, uh, intervened in the, in the British uh, newspaper industry in, in uh, beginning in 1969, uh, by by setting up the sun, well, by buying the news of the world and setting up the sun, um, I think we wouldn't have the Times, for instance, and uh, we probably wouldn't have the Sunday Times, and we might not have maybe one other title. And the final thing I want to just say before before I, I, I take questions is that um, uh, the other impression that I have, again, having gone right through the whole bloody business from, from, from January the 1st, 1900, in fact, even before, uh, right through to December the 31st, 2000, and indeed afterward that, um, was how good, the, certainly the serious press uh, in Britain is today, how, what, a, what a high quality it has, um, how good its, its interpretive side is, as well as its reporting side. Um, this, of course, is a late comer. People rather tend to forget that until until the really the fifties, uh, newspapermen didn't feel uh, and journalists in general didn't feel it was necessary to tell people what things meant. They just simply told them what was happening that day. So, Hitler was introducing a, a new act in the Reichstag, or Stalin uh, had had, uh, had uh, sentenced extra numbers of people to to be. Uh, uh, well, his courts had uh, to be to be sent off to Siberia, but nothing about what it actually meant. Well, very little about what it really meant. And in the 1950s, and I suggest without a, a shred of originality that that it was the Suez uh, affair, of course, in 1956, which which changed British journalism as well as British politics, as well as British foreign policy and everything else. Um, until until Suez, uh, it was um, uh, the, the the that kind of acceptance of officialdom and what officialdom did uh, was pretty general, pretty widespread, and it was only after that that journalists started to tell their 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 readers in any large amounts what these things might actually mean, what they might betoken, and. That's uh, that you know we're we're still living in the uh, in the benefit of, of that today. What's going to happen to journalism in general, to uh, newspapers, and and indeed to my own organisation, the BBC? Uh, God knows, and I don't think. Well, I'm certain that at no stage uh, uh, in the period that I was covering did anybody have anything like the degree of uncertainty and doubt about the future that we. That we now have, um, I've talked. I've talked long enough. Now is the time, please, for, for for you know comments and questions. And I I'm I'm happy to answer anything and say anything. I'm too old to care. <laughs> There's a gentleman right at the back, actually, right beside you. This will never happen again. Hi, hi. My name is Andrew uh, Storm. I don't work for any news organisation, but from your experience, um, when you come across a news event. What's the general advice you have for getting across the message of what you see, especially for radio and um, uh, in the written media when you don't have TV pictures? What's your general advice for getting across the image to the listener? Oh, I, I, sp I don't really have a kind of... Uh, uh, I mean, I, all, you can, all you can do... I've been a, both a... A newspaper uh, reporter, though not not for very long in my life, and uh, a radio reporter for a long period of time. I don't think it's any different from being, in that sense, from being a television reporter. I think the basic instincts are the same, and they're, they're I would say they're they're the they're the instincts that that Philip Gibbs and loads and loads of others um, would themselves have followed. I mean, it it really isn't. I don't think it's anything more than just. <coughs> Trying, just trying to find out as best you can what's happening and get it back as quickly as possible. I know that that uh, doesn't sound uh, a very profound 
answer, and I, I apologize for it. But you know, journalism is a very blunt instrument, uh, as, as alas, we, we know. And uh, um, uh, the journalists are, are, are always, in my experience, taken by surprise by what happens. And um, you just have to hope that your, your basic instincts will have some kind of, uh, of, of, of outlet and that you'll be able to, to um, register something which is worth having. But I'm, I'm sorry, that's a very feeble, I'll, I'll try to do better in a moment. There's a gentleman here. Aziz Khalidi, uh, my question, um, if you've been appointed to uh, be an editor for Daily Mail, what did you change about the Daily Mail? Oh, what a, what a nice question. Well, you see, the trouble is um, that, that uh, if you're the editor, you're not necessarily the, the person that makes the decisions. Uh, there, are, there are people above you. Uh, there's a there's a there's a, a super editor, and then above the super editor is a is an owner. Actually, nowadays a rather sort of mild and uh, and gentle uh, owner, as I understand it. I've only met him once. He was very nice to me and offered me a glass of champagne. So I I take it that that's how he always is. But um, uh, it, it's it it you see. You, you, if it, with a newspaper like the like the uh, Daily Mail, and it's no different from uh, a newspaper like the Guardian in one in in one sense, or a newspaper or a, a, a news organisation like the BBC in another sense, um, it, it isn't just like a car that you get in and drive off in your own particular fashion. It it has a will of its own. I mean, the editor, the biggest problem any editor has is in making the faintest of of changes in in the way that this that this uh, organization runs down the road uh, very difficult so you'd have to you'd have to change the entire to change the way the daily mail was you'd have to change uh, the entire ethos the entire philosophy of that everybody in that organization from top to bottom had grown up with and, and was used to. So I, I, don't, I, I don't, I mean, I've, I personally felt um, that I, when I came across bits of the Daily Mail, little clippings and things from the Daily Mail that I wanted to use, it was often with a real sense of, of enjoyment and relief because there's a liveliness about the mail, even though, you know, Almost every article always seems to have been right down throughout history about how appalling something is and what a what an outrage it is. You know, the outrage is a very is a is a, is the Daily Mail uh, sort of uh, default um, uh, emotion, um, and it's always been like that since since well certainly since 1900. I think it was oh, whenever it was founded. I think 1895 or 97 something, and. Um, so that there is always a, um, a, a sense of, 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 of the, there's, a, there's a Daily Mail story, is what I'm trying to say. There's a typical Daily Mail story. To say to, the, to address the, the, the staff, call them in together and say, from now on, actually, you know, we're going to be really interested in, in uh, stories uh, um, showing how, um, you know, innocent people come to this country and need our support for, for, uh, for their futures and, uh, you know, because it's so dangerous and we, we mustn't send them back, would just leave the place very quiet and nobody <laughs> would know quite what to say. And when they got back to their desks, they'd, be, they'd go back to outrage, you know, uh, and because that's what, that's what you do. It's the same in the, in the BBC. It'd be very difficult to sort of suddenly announce a new a new tone, a new approach. Um, people have tried it, God knows, uh, but they're usually buried in the Blue Peter Garden. Um, do we have any, there's a gentleman here. Uh, Matthew Tippett, two very short questions. Um, the first one is, um, do you believe in positive news stories? And the second one is, have you allowed yourself to ever be misled or subsequently thought, actually, I didn't report that in quite the true vein? Yes. Um, I. I um, I've I never I've never been a great enthusiast for the notion of the of the positive story. The trouble is, you see, I mean, I might have been better if I hadn't spent so much of my time over the years in in Soviet Russia, 
and the Soviet Empire, where only good news was printed in the newspapers. And where friends of mine, for instance, I, I'm thinking particularly of, of, of a, a group of people I used to know in, in Czechoslovakia, when it was Czechoslovakia, in Prague. And they, they would go through, they were, they were real kind of pro-Western, uh, liberal-minded people, supporters of, uh, of, of the dissident movement, uh, Charter 77. Uh, Lovely, lovely people. They go through the newspaper laughing at everything. I mean, you laughed at it because, you know, it, it told you, your newspaper told you two things. One, how fantastic everything was in the Soviet bloc. And two, what a load of rubbish they were on the other side of the wall and how everything was falling apart. And, and uh, um, you know, people were murdered on the streets and the, the, the illegitimacy was, was going up and corruption and crime and God knows what. And they, they believed the precise opposite because they knew they weren't getting the facts. So they, they, believed that, they believed that the West was absolutely wonderful, was superb, that, that crime rates were, because they, they were supposed to be, according to, the, to, to, to Rude Pravo, whatever it was, they were supposed to be so high in the West, that meant they thought, well, you've got to cut that by at least 75%. So they're probably a lot lower than we have here in, in communist Czechoslovakia. Um, production rates, you know, production rate, strikes. Uh, they were always going on in, in Rude Prava about strikes in the West. And, and nobody, well, this kind of people at least, didn't believe a word they read. There was so much good news that nobody thought it could possibly be true. And of course, they were absolutely right. I think if you can't, if you can't pick up a, a newspaper or watch a television news bulletin or radio, listen to a radio news bulletin uh, without thinking that this has somehow been engineered by propagandists for a good, for a, a particular purpose, then, then you'll, you'll not believe anything. And, um, you know, of course, there's, there, are, there are all sorts of, I think it's really necessary to examine the nature of of, 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 of the reports that you read and, 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 and watch. And I think it's a, one of the best, one of the best um, uh, guards, that, safeguards that we have is that, is that people are critical of what we, what we do. But I, I do think that you've got to be able to say hand on heart, um, whatever I'm telling you is as far as I can make out, as true as, 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 true as I know how to tell it, and I'm not telling it to you for a particular reason to cheer you up, for instance. Have I, uh, have I allowed myself to be, um, to be um, um, misinterpreted, uh, to, to, to be told things that I knew, not, not, not that I'm aware, well, no, not, in that case, not, uh, because I, I would have, I'm not, uh, you know, if I were aware of it, I certainly wouldn't have, wouldn't have done it. Um, I'm not, and, and, and no time, uh, and no time would I, and I don't know anybody else uh, in my, of my colleagues who would, who would do a, a, a something like that because it's bad for, bad for business, you know. Um, I, I, I don't like my job so well that I'm prepared to, to shovel shit to, to, to keep it. Um, and, uh, but have I, been, have I been misled? Oh, yes, endless times. And, you know, because... Um, you 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 can't always be certain about the quality of your of your informant. No matter how hard you try, you sometimes screw up. And and uh, uh, you know there are a lot of people around. I'm trying to think of any examples. I can't can't actually think of any examples. But uh, I I I know there are. Have I been? You didn't ask me, but uh, there's no reason why I shouldn't say it. Have I been? Um, uh, have I been uh, um, um, censored? By, by the BBC, uh, yes, once, uh, only once that I can think of, although I was very much aware of another uh, case of censorship that happened to somebody else. Uh, in my case, uh, actually, it, it was too complicated and boring to go into, but it was something that the, uh, the IRA discovered, uh, this is when I was uh, working in Ireland, uh, the IRA discovered a letter that had been written by uh, a British politician uh, who subsequently became uh, um, Secretary for Northern Ireland, uh, Merlin Rees, which said something rather kind of um, quite, uh, quite awkward that he shouldn't have said. 
about, about his idea about what should happen in Ireland in the future. Very, very awkward, very clumsy. Uh, wouldn't happen now because, you know, some Alistair Campbell figure would go and beat him to a pulp for, for, for even thinking of doing it. But, but in those days, things were, things were freer. I took this to the BBC. It thought it was a good story. Um, the BBC got, um, uh, got in touch with uh, the Northern Ireland office who said that they had been through their files and couldn't find uh, a copy of the letter, so they wondered whether it, they thought it might not be entirely genuine. Um, three weeks later, uh, the letter was published, was made public by the IRA. This was given to me by some IRA contact of mine. Um, later, the IRA made it public, and the Northern Ireland office actually found the copy and said the they didn't think there was anything in it, and they couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. So um, that was, I feel, I felt bad about that. Uh, on the other hand, if, if a government ministry tells you, uh, with no matter how carefully the words were chosen, that it doesn't seem to be true, I suppose maybe you have. The, the case that I, I thought was much worse was uh, of a friend of mine who was hanging out outside Long Kesh um, uh, detention center this was very early on, on uh, after a direct rule had been instituted in Northern Ireland and found people coming out, just coming out, you know, with bundles. They were, they were let out in, in quite large uh, chunks and uh, coming out with, with sort of brown paper parcels under their arms and saying um, again and again and again that they'd been tortured in one way or another by the British soldiers, that they'd had... The, the stories all, all cohered. I mean, they'd had buckets put over their heads and the buckets had been beaten with spoons and there'd be white no use of white noise. All of these things absolutely established afterwards. Um, came back, uh, nobody wanted to use it uh, because I suppose it was the, the, there wasn't any sort of backup at that stage. Following morning it was in all the newspapers and we, uh, we followed on. Um, I wasn't very happy about that but since it wasn't me I didn't feel any necessity actually to resign but I think my, the, my friend did, uh, did, did, did resign. As a so that's my only experience, thank God, with, uh, with uh, censorship. Hi, uh, Gareth Bentley. Um, I, I interviewed you, you on this um, subject before, so, but just a quick question. God, I hope um, I can give the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I just wondered when you talked about the Daily Mail's default emotion, whether you thought there was a BBC foreign correspondent default emotion, and if so, what it, what it might be? Yes, I think, I think there is, but it's quite difficult um, to spot it, really. I, I'm, I'm sure there are, I mean, there are certain stories that BBC foreign correspondents, uh, perhaps I in particular, uh, really like. Um, and I'm trying to think of an example. Um, there, there is, of course, I mean, uh, let, let me just be general since I'm finding it difficult to think of anything in particular. Um, there is a, there is a, t there's a tone in the BBC. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of, as it were, white noise that goes through the system, just as there's a white noise through the, the Guardian, just as there's a white noise through the Daily Mail and through the Sun. Um, I'm not sure it's white in the case of the Sun. And um, it, it just, um, you know, you know what the kind of story is that's gonna that's gonna ring the bell, um, and I, I I had one uh, the other day. Um, uh, I was uh, about I don't know about a, a week ago, ten days ago. And I was in Fallujah in in Iraq, and um, I've been wanting to go there for a long time because um, you know we've been hearing all these stories about about birth defects among children are, are born there after 2000, the 2004 fighting. And it's, it's well, I've never f found it possible to go there. And very, I think one or two people have. Um, uh, Patrick Coburn of The Independent has been there, but uh, didn't ha had other things to, to do when he was there. I mean, even now, uh, we, we were local people, uh, the, the local journalists who were helping us said we really shouldn't stay there much longer than about two or three hours. Um, and they started to get very nervous. And th this is at a time when it is actually moderately peaceful and you can uh, travel there without being too worried about car bombs and so on by the side of the road, bombs by the side of the road. But um, uh, 
Um, and I knew, I knew that's the kind of story the BBC likes. Not you know, immediately, of course, uh, everybody assumes that's because it's an anti-American story. Not so, not, not so at all. It's that it's, um, it's that it's something that n everybody suspects and nobody has quite managed to get. Uh, it's something that uh, makes really good, sad to say it, and what a thing, well, what a way to, to, to put it, but makes pictures that everybody's going to look at and not, not think, I mean, ch children with, with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each hand, kids born with three heads, stuff like that. I mean, this is, this is, this is appalling, um, but it's the kind of thing, you know, it, it's kind of evidence of something really bad and, and, um, but I just, I just felt, I, I just knew that they'd, and of course, when when we got back, they all want, want, wanted it, and they all played it up tremendously to the, to the, I think, actually quite understandable irritation of the poor old American embassy who um, felt that we had, you know, they they just felt they couldn't turn on the television or radio without hearing this story, which must. When you've got as many outlets as the as the BBC has, uh, it must be quite quite tedious constantly to 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 get that. But I mean that's you know that's life. So yes, I, the simple answer yes, there are there are there are BBC stories, um, and sometimes uh, you, you know the, sometimes it irritates me, uh, and I'm one of the main purveyors. I mean, it irritates me that we always go to the hospital. Uh, of course, guess where I went in Fallujah first. Um, but nevertheless, there is a sort of, there's a kind of uh, of um, reach me down um, sort of uh, the story layout. You know, start with hospital, go and see some people, come back, do a few pictures of blokes with guns, and then a piece to camera. It's a, it, the, the, it's a, a possibly a little bit um, a, a formulaic. It's a lady. Hi, Morag Livingston. Um, I just wondered if you'd ever been stopped from going somewhere before you got there, like I believe Don McCullum was before he got to the Falklands. Um, stop, stopped by by whom? By not not being allowed a visa or. Oh uh, yeah, no, all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, there's uh, there's a long list of of places where where well, there's a list at any rate where I'm I you know can't get visas to. Um, Iran is an example of a country where I um, go from time to time a short bursts and then for long years at a time, six, seven years, I'm not allowed back. And uh, I was there for the, uh, of course, fascinating election and its aftermath in, back in June. Um, and uh, I don't suppose I'll be, uh, I'll be back there for, for, for quite a, a long time. And the BBC correspondent got thrown out, was accused, in fact, of paying for the thug that shot that poor girl. Um, I mean, what an accusation to make. I, I said he should have sued, but uh, he, he thought that this might not be good for getting another visa. Um, uh, but it was she's not going to get anyway. Um, um, you know, there's, there's that, that's... I'm, fortunately, I mean, the thing is, of course, nobody really likes that kind of thing. Nobody really wants to be barred from a country. I, you know, there are only about what 189 of them, or something, you know. And you tick them off, and you 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 upset them one by one, and soon all you're left with is Austria. And <laughs> um, and even that, actually, after recent events, might not be wholly keen on having you. Um, and but I, I just I just think um, I've actually now uh, I'm so uh, full of myself and so grand that I think it's their bad luck rather than mine. Um, <laughs> Which it isn't at all, of course. But uh, I, that's, how I, that's how I think. And I just think, well, screw you. There's lots of other interesting and nice places to go to. Um, but uh, this visa business uh, just drives me up the wall. Now, you know, I mean, China, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to China at the end of the month. Um, I've got to deliver a lecture about journalistic ethics uh, to the Chinese to Chinese officials. I mean, Christ knows what this is going to be like. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, to it. But um, 
uh, aside from, from doing some reporting. But, you know, they're saying at the moment, they say uh, you're going to be there for, uh, uh, as we understand it, we need to know how many reports you're going to make. We need to know exactly what shots you're going to use in your, in your report. And, um, well, at the moment, I've just, uh, I haven't answered, actually. I've done a traditional Simpson thing and just ignored it. But, uh, like with my bank manager, but the, uh, the, no doubt, like with my bank manager, I won't be able to keep this up forever, and I'll have to, uh, I'll have to, to, to do it. So this bloody business of visas, I think, is a, is a scandal. You know, dear old um, Ernest Bevin, I think probably the greatest foreign secretary this country has ever had, um, much mocked because he ha he was a uh, member of the he was a leader of the Transport and General Workers Union, had a very strong Cockney accent, and somebody when he became uh, foreign secretary in the um, Attlee government after the after the Second World War, uh, somebody rather snooty from the the uh, um, uh, Spectator went to interview him and said, "What's your, you know, w would you sort of uh, amuse us by telling us what your foreign policy is if you have one?" and uh, he said, yeah, my foreign policy is to go down at Charing Cross Station and buy a ticket to anywhere I damn well please. And everybody thought, oh, oh how charming, you know, how amusing and uh, uh, this uh, funny unlettered fellow. But I think he's absolutely right. That would be my foreign policy. Go down to Heathrow, get a ticket to wherever I damn well please without having to have one of those irritating stamps on the passport. Sorry, ramble finished. Yeah, there was a gentleman there. And then yeah. we Hello, uh, Rob McMillan. I just wonder, you talked about censorship. If, uh, given the contacts that you have, whether it's in Baghdad, whether it's in Kabul and within the ministries and also with some of the other people, when you're putting a story together, do you ever find that you have to censor yourself from the security services, whether it's from the British security services or the American, in terms of some of the information that you come across? And if so, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you, where do you draw the line? Um, very, very difficult question. I, I wouldn't, to be honest, I don't think that's how it, how it impinges on a, on a reporter so much as um, how, how do you protect the people that, that have told you things that perhaps they shouldn't tell you, whether they're, whether they're, they're, they're intelligence people or, or, or perhaps, perhaps a bit naive, perhaps just over, out, overspoke themselves, misspoke themselves in some way. Um, I'm not one of those journalists that, that says, well, you said it, so you've got to live with the consequences. I think life's too short to, uh, to take that kind of uh, sort of tough, fairly fierce line. Um, I wouldn't want to feel that I'd betrayed a, a, a confidence in some way. Um, so I, I, these things, uh, differ from, and, and it's part of the pleasure of the job in a sense that you get these immense conundrums, moral conundrums. How, you know, how do you how do you sort it out? How do you deal with it? How do you how do you cope with it without without betraying the people that 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 trusted you not to betray them? I mean, when you when you it's it's bad enough for for, for you know with British journalists somebody like me uh, doing interviews uh, not, not not with our friend but but with others um, you know to make certain they're not going to stitch you up but when when your life is perhaps on the line a bit or certainly your job is on the line I think you have to be really quite careful but you do have and this is where the real kind of pomposity comes in I'm afraid but you do have a, a Duty to be honest and not to be and not to be dishonest on anybody's behalf. So it, these things are terribly fine judgments, and I mean, I, you know, I must have got it wrong so many, many, many times. But uh, you just hope not to, really. There's a late. There was a lady here somewhere. I should make me run around. Now I should have somebody down there then. Hi, I'm just wondering what you think of the young journalists of today and if you have any advice for them. Um, well, I mean, I don't, I don't see uh, any, any kind of um, cultural or, 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 or sort of uh, intellectual difference between young, young journalists today, the ones that, that I see, which is not actually sadly very many because... 
by the time they get to the BBC, they're probably not allowed in until they're 45. Um, uh, but I do, I do come across, but they, they seem to me to be exactly like, like I was when I was 22 and started being a, a full-time journalist. Um, you know, often very naive, and, and, uh, uh, but often with a real sense of, of, of kind of duty, which I find really, really very attractive, uh, a sense that they're doing something by being journalists. You know, you have every time you get one of these films about how wonderful journalists are, which Hollywood seems to want to turn out for reasons I, don't, I can't understand, you get waves of young, of young people coming into the business, uh, feeling that they, they too want to be part of a sort of crusade against, against evil. I don't suppose that feeling lasts terribly long, sadly. Um, but what advice would I, but so I don't, I mean, I just think, I just think it's the same, the same as, I, that really is the message of, one of the many messages of my book, that it's the same kind of people and that journalists today and journalists in say 1910 would find themselves understanding each other entirely during writing the same kind of stuff and reporting on the same kind of stories. Uh, maybe that's a disadvantage, maybe it's wrong, I don't know, but it's, it certainly seems to be the fact. Um, what advice to give, these are hard days for, for the future of journalism. Uh, somebody said to me yesterday, I think, uh, a bright-eyed, highly intelligent young woman said to me, you know, she longed to be a journalist, what was, what was my advice for getting into the business? And actually, if I didn't say this at all, because you don't want to be too gloomy, but my advice would be to get into some kind of job which was close to journalism, where you could uh, sort of find, get work out the basics of it, I don't know, PR or something like that, and wait for the moment to see whether, whether, whether journalism has a proper future, the kind of journalism that, 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 that we have had. Uh, I know that's immensely gloomy. So I didn't say that at all. I said what I often say to people, which is the best way into any form of journalism, written or, or, um, uh, or broadcasting journalism, is to, is to go to a local, a local newspaper or a local radio station be prepared to work for absolutely nothing because they, they, you know, um, William Wilberforce would be interested in their in their management uh, proceedings, and uh, it's, uh, um, you know, just work for nothing for for for, for some time, and uh, and then you usually kind of make it, but make it to what you see? I mean, I just don't. I, I'm sure that some form of of uh, of um, uh, n n newspaper, something whether it's in paper, uh, or whether it's in some gadget, some some iPad. What a fantastic name! Women all over the world must have thought about that. Um, uh, I got my iPad. Um, uh, you know, whether it's that, whether it's um, uh, something that we nobody's even thought of yet. God knows what happens with television. I mean, you know, the audiences for television dropping hugely. Um, Will will there be a future for organised news reporting on television? God knows. God knows. I mean, I suppose there will be, but uh, who, who can tell? Thank you, David. Nib <coughs> Sorry, uh, David Niblock. Do you have any regrets, and also anything of which you're particularly proud? Oh, regrets. <laughs> Yes, I've, I've got uh, I've got so many, and they're all about they're all about mistakes, really. I mean, I've got I've got practical regrets. Um, not many days pass uh, without uh, my thinking about how I uh, led a team of people, including my local translator, into being bombed by by. The Americans in 2003, and my translators would now would now be 32. I think um, lost his life, um, died in 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 front of us. Um, that's the kind of regret that you know you don't ever get.
get away from. And I, 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 from, I don't mean to say, I, don't, I really don't mean to say I'm haunted by it in the sense of, 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 of guilt because I feel I'm responsible for it, because I, I wasn't. I mean, we, there was no reason to think that an American um, aircraft would bomb us at a, at a, uh, yeah, where we were and we, given the company we were in, which was other American troops. Um, but nevertheless, you know, you do think he, he, he joined he joined us because he'd seen me on, on television and he thought he could trust us to look after him and uh, he was wrong. Um, so there's not, as I say, not many days when I don't, I don't regret that. A uh, lot of stories that I, I regret. Um, I very much, fortunately not for the BBC so much, um, the BBC does prevent you from going out on any kind of, of limb um, and giving, uh, giving um, too, too strong an opinion on things. Sometimes it's irritating. More often than not, it's a bit of a relief because so often your, your, your opinions turn out to be crap. I, I, I uh, was very certain that Russia in, in, from 1992 onwards uh, was going to uh, collapse into fascism and and uh, and, and brutality, and somehow, um, you know, a drunken old soak that he was, um, uh, you know, it, it 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 was led by a man who who managed to avoid that, but it didn't stop me writing all about how it was going to happen in the in the Spectator, which I then used to be part of uh, about one of the writers for. And um, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I often think about that and I often think, bugger, you know, why did I just, why didn't I just say, on the other hand, of course, <laughs> things may, you know, it's, it's so much a, a, a matter of tone and you, you, can, you can convince yourself so easily. That's why I, I, I'm, nowadays we're all banned in the BBC from writing uh, news stuff for magazines and newspapers and yeah okay I mean I, I miss I miss uh, bits of it I miss some money actually apart from the else but I miss I miss that sense of having another outlet that that uh, that you can go for but you know there's something about writing for a newspaper perhaps it's because I'm a kind of battery hen you know looking out through the wire at the at the free free range hens outside, and that that just that they break open the wire for enough to let you get out and lay an egg or two outside, and so often the egg is uh, you know is a bit goes a bit further than you would allow yourself to do inside the coop, and so I um, uh, a bit maybe it's good for me not to not to do that and to be all prim and BBC like. Um. No, I, I mean I don't know. Um, I, I actually the main thing I'm proud of is that I'm 65 and I'm still in a job. I, I <laughs> that um, I'm proud of little things. I am proud of little. I'm proud. I'm proud of a letter I wrote. I want to go into this too much, but um, there was a time when that awful business uh, the, with. Um, um, uh, Hutton and uh, and uh, all of that dreadful, dreadful business, which I look back on with loathing, and and uh, find it hard to be charitable in any sense to some of the people involved in that. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things that the BBC started doing was kind of ritually apologising, like some sort of uh, an ancient uh, a Japanese uh, a warlord after being found out, you know, and. Uh, uh, there was a terrible man, a frightful little man called Richard Ryder, who was the acting uh, um, um, uh, chairman of the BBC for a short period of time. And uh, he came out and he couldn't seem to stop apologizing for, for the things that I, I felt we didn't have all that much to apologize for, maybe a bit, but not, not, not kind of to the degree that he was doing it. And um, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a letter. I, wrote, I thought oh, I could not bear that future, some future historian would go through the, the, the records of the BBC and they wouldn't find anybody that had actually said anything about it. And I just wrote a letter, uh, um, um, you know, um, in my name, not, an, uh, not anonymously, saying we'd had enough, we'd had enough apologizing. We, we didn't want another single bloody apology, if you don't mind, please. 
and I, 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 uh, I, did, I did use the word bloody. And I, I felt, I felt, I uh, didn't get an answer. I felt, uh, um, I felt better for that. But whether that's pride or not, I just think it was, uh, it just, just felt a bit better. Gentleman there. Not really a gentleman, former correspondent. <laughs> um, Colin Bickler. Um, one of the things that interests me, John, in, in all this is about the correspondent and what he does and what he doesn't do. What I don't hear, and which I think is important for anybody else coming along, is the reliance of the correspondent in TV on his camera, on his camera crew and so on, and in general on local people that they have to work with or not. And where would we be if we didn't have these people around? And you mentioned, sadly, the man who died in Iraq, but the, 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 the story of foreign correspondents is full of this sort of thing. Absolutely, no, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, um, uh, that that it also that relates also uh, to some extent to the uh, to the question that the gentleman there asked earlier about um, and I, I think it's in a different direction from how what that he was tending in but but that uh, what you uh, how you get your information and what happens to the people with, uh, as you say Colin what happens effectively to the people that are that after you've gone back and you've got the plaudits and you're <laughs> now thinking about a different story in a different part of the world, but you know they've got the the cops uh, still on their backs and and uh, they the cops want to know where you got the information from and so forth. And there's a I think a tremendous duty of care uh, for for people like that. You've got to use them with the greatest sensitivity to their to their own interests uh, not easy to do um, but um, I, I I think that that's one of the major major um, uh, elements in in uh, in, a, in a decent reporter's um, uh, modus operandi for the cameraman yes absolutely I mean there are fewer and fewer of all of us nowadays um, and I'm sure they'll be asking me to do the camera work soon but uh, um, yeah, I mean, you can't do it without them, and uh, um, you know, they're they're the 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 great uh, the great companions of your of your uh, time in these on these stories. They make it uh, their company makes it really worthwhile. I've I have, as I said earlier, I've 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 been a newspaper correspondent briefly, only briefly, and not not very uh, distinguished, um, and a, and a, a radio correspondent for years, twelve fifteen years. Um, both of which are lonely profession. I mean, this is why this is why it often scandalizes people when they discover that how newspapers, uh, the, the correspondents for newspapers who are um, uh, you know in, supposedly in, co in competition with one another work so closely together uh, to feed each other information and help each other along. But you you have to do this in in uh, um, you know when you're out there. On your, on your uh, otherwise on your own in difficult perhaps difficult circumstances, um, with television it's the exact opposite. You you, you it's the most uh, well was when when it was at its height uh, the most uh, um, competitive kind of, of of thing as as you know Tom. I mean um, uh, we have in our audience uh, um, a very distinguished American correspondent from the days when. The, the 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 networks fought each other and would have killed each other and certainly bribed each other. I'm not you of course you are the single sole exception but but you know where the competition was 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 ferocious and people lost their jobs for a single fact that was wrong or a single story that was missed um, that uh, th those days uh, seem to be now over uh, even in Britain because sadly the the competition for the BBC is much less than than it and it used to be Sky and uh, and and ITN not 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 able to provide it. But so, you, you do tend to work much more closely with your own little team. I mean, my I'm I'm uh, because of my uh, extraordinary a a age and incompetence. I now have a producer like a kind of um, like a, um, a you know a, a sort of white starched uh, nurse to go around with me and. Uh, um, wipe my bottom and uh, tell me what to do next and so forth, um, which is wonderful. Actually, I haven't uh, had such a good time uh, for a long time, and um, so I go around with a with a with a, uh, a cameraman and a producer. But uh, most people just go around with a with a cameraman, and many many increasing many people just do it on their own. Sir, 
Uh, uh, can we take this gentleman here first? Then I promise to. Oh, sorry, you've actually handed it over. Let's do it. Let's do it that way. I'll I'll be very brief. No, no, no. <laughs> I won't be. Okay. Uh, I can't. Um, be. My name's Kevin. Uh, just quick question. Obviously, you must see some incredibly intense things, and um, I'm just wondering how you cope. I mean, do you have with your producer and your cameraman a sort of a, a sort of a black humour between yourselves to sort of to sort of balance the sort of crushing things you see, or do you just sit there and, and get crushed, or do you kind of go, well, I'm doing this for the greater good of, of getting the story out, and, and I mean, I just wondered how you, how you cope yes, with um, it. Yes, it, it's, uh, there, are, there are kind of different techniques for doing it. Being a part of a, of a close-knit group is very, very important in that. I mean, the, the most intense uh, um, uh, example of that, I suppose, it, go, it goes back to our, my, this accident that we had in in uh, northern Iraq in 2003, when altogether 18 people were killed uh, by, in this single bomb. Uh, it was a thousand pound bomb dropped right in the middle of us. And I don't think any of us was more than about 18 or 19 yards from the bomb. And uh, some of us were killed, some of us were injured, and some of us survived uh, entirely, uh, almost entirely. Um, and it, it all just simply depended where you were standing and the, the actual direction of the bomb, which was explained to me is called the bug splat effect, like a bomb, like an insect hitting your windscreen and it goes in a sort of fan <laughs> thing. So I, I was only as far from, from where the bomb dropped as I am from the back of the, the room here and a thousand pound bomb makes quite a loud noise um, and, and yet, you know, survived with just deafness and a big lump of shrapnel on my backside, but that was it. Uh, my hip, I like to call it, but my doctor calls it my buttock. Um, he's a man without finer feelings. Um, <laughs> pretty unpleasant, and I mean, we, you know, I, I watched quite a few people, I can't think how many, but six, seven, eight people burning to death, not able to do anything about it, which feels pretty rough. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, you know the, the the that sense of sort of survivor guilt as far as the uh, as far as our colleague was concerned, um, and but it was just we 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 carried on. Um, it was the first day of the sort of advance on Baghdad, and we were up in the north, so it took us about five days, I think, to get down to Baghdad. Um, and I, I was just there on my own because everybody else felt that they had to, uh, you know, they didn't feel they could carry on with the thing, understandably. But I was just there with, with my producer uh, at the time. And he and I talked about it absolutely obsessively the whole time. We'd wake up at, in the morning, and we'd start talking about the whole incident. We'd go to sleep at night, halfway through, still talking about it. And by the fifth day, I think we were sick to death of it. I mean, it was a sort of, it was a kind of intensive therapy of a kind that you wouldn't normally get, you know. And I, I, we, I, I think we just cope, we just sort of sorted it, really. I, I once had another really unpleasant experience in, in, in Afghanistan. I mean, I have lots all over the place, but this one sort of stands out a bit. Um, we, we had to cover, we didn't have to, I suppose, but we did cover uh, um, a triple execution hanging, uh, which was done in the most appallingly uh, cruel way imaginable. And I stood there looking at this thing, thinking I'm going to have nightmares about this for the rest of my bloody life. And that night, we all had nightmares, bad nightmares. Uh, the next night, uh, yup, we also had nightmares. And the third night, I had to write a, an article. In those days, I had a column in one of the papers I had to write about it. And I wrote about it with some, in some detail um, in a way that I couldn't go into it on, on television, really. And um, it just kind of sorted it as far as I was concerned. Whereas I noticed that the others still, still have, in, in one case, I think, still, still is troubled by, by what he saw. But... For me, it's gone. It's a it's a it's a form of of, of therapy. So I know. Can we the, the gentleman there? Can we? Uh... Paul Alexander. Um, seven years ago, we were told that London was facing a forty-five minute missile <coughs> attack. Um, that proved to be a slight exaggeration on, on reflection. Um, and there was a distinct lack of political 
and journalistic scrutiny at the time. How do you account for that, and what lessons do we need to learn? In, in the interests of absolute, I suppose, accuracy, although why one should bother, because it is a good story, it wasn't really London that was supposed to be going to be. It was going to be British troops in Cyprus. But, I mean, you know, I know, I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, I think that there was a really ugly kind of enthusiasm generated uh, um, in the in the press and I'm, I'm sure in broadcasting uh, 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 for a war it's one of the most disturbing things I've written about it and I, I, I mean I feel really strongly about it the times when you need the calmest judgment the best information there's the somehow or another uh, a, a sense that 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 this is not only going to happen, but it's actually almost good, good for the industry that it's going to happen. It's good for your, your career, good for your company, good for your profits, good for your viewing figures. I don't suppose many people would be coarse enough, coarse-spirited enough to think of it in precisely those terms, but I, I, I think a lot of that uh, exists. And, and, I mean, there was a lot of heart-searching in the US media uh, afterwards, and 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 people were making these points about their newspapers and about their television organisations. Um, I, I I I claim uh, uh, sort of I was out of the country the whole time, so I don't know how quite how well or badly the BBC did. And to be absolutely honest, I don't really want to find out because I suspect it may not have been as good as I hope it was. We were fortunate enough that, that we were very aware of the anti-war uh, sentiment as well as the pro-war sentiment, perhaps more directed at the BBC than at any other news organization, I think. And so when you get people yelling at you from both sides and accusing you of all sorts of things from both sides, it does make you much more careful about what you say. But I, 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 I can't say with any authority what the BBC was really like because I haven't examined the broadcasting. These things, are, these times are quite ugly and you know you don't have to go back to, to August 1914 and people storming the, uh, um, the recruiting stations to realize that there, the, there is something about an impending war which kind of gets people together and makes them, uh, makes them start thinking with one with one voice, well, you can't think with one voice. You know what I mean. I mean, uh, just just kind of all taking the same the same line. Um, I not 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 journalism's greatest greatest time. Uh, in fact, I would say probably one of the very very worst. Gentleman there, and then then here, and then perhaps we, no no we're going to. Um, excuse me, my my voice is going, so I'll make it brief. Um, Steve Barnett. I, You've made some comments recently about being pessimistic about the future of the BBC. So I've got two BBC questions. First is, <clears throat> is there any reason today to be any more pessimistic than um, people have been for the last 10, 20, 30 years? There is a, a narrative about of pessimism that's run through the history of the BBC. So any particular reason for that now? And the second question is, just if you could reflect briefly on how journalism as practiced by the BBC you think has changed in the 30, 40 years that you've been there uh, institutionally as opposed to reflecting how the outside culture has changed? Okay. Um, you're absolutely right. There is a, there's a sort of, there's something uh, uh, in, in the culture inside the BBC as opposed to most other organizations I've kind of observed uh, that does sort of, uh, it's, as though, it's as though we're all going around with, uh, with signs that say the end of the world is nigh. There is, I, I certainly agree with that. Um, but, uh, you know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean to say they're not out to get you. And um, the, uh, there are, there's a greater, far greater intensity of people being out to get us now than there has been at any other time in my 44 years with the BBC, and I, I suspect, uh, therefore, ever. Um, it comes from an entire range, a, a, a quite a wide coalition 
of, of interests and attitudes. Um, it comes from uh, often quite sort of conservative minded people who believe that the license fee is a tax uh, which nobody has ever really voted on or agreed on um, and that there's a desire not to not to pay it um, not for the money not but because of the because of the principle um, there's uh, an, a, there's a, a, a disapproval it seems to me of a lot of the BBC's programming um, decisions uh, that that uh, again is 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 fiercer than at any time that that, that I can remember um, a criticism uh, which is more more intense there are there are more voices raised against the BBC now than, than at any, any stage that I can remember because of the, the internet, because everybody with a, with a, a voice, a grievance, an opinion <laughs> now has a, a way of, 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 of attracting attention to it. Um, all of these things are, would be difficult, but, not, but just kind of really, I, don't, I think we would have shrugged e each one of those off. After all, the license fee is the law of the land. Um, you don't pay it, you, you, get, you get jailed for it in the worst case scenarios. Um, that's all fine. The trouble is something's happened in poli within politics. Um, the, the key, the, the sort of what, what, what uh, um, 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 and I, how typical, I, that's absolutely, I'm really pleased with myself for that because I was gonna make you a classical Latin uh, um, uh, example and uh, forgot the name of the bloke that wrote it. So that, that serves me right. Hung with my um, the the, uh, the fact is that um, uh, the key to the, the secret of empire, it's Tacitus's phrase, the secret of empire, uh, which was that the army can overthrow emperors um, in, in, in ancient Rome. Uh, the secret of, of, of controlling the BBC is, is out get your hands on the license fee, start controlling the license fee, the level of the license fee, the, the degree to which it goes up or, 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 or not, and you start to control the, the, the nature of the BBC. This, was not, this has not been, it's been threatened, it was threatened under Wilson, uh, it was threatened uh, certainly under Thatcher, neither of them actually did anything about it. Uh, it's taken the, the, that kind of ferocity that Alistair Campbell brought into British public life uh, to, to, uh, to happen, and the Conservatives have followed, uh, have followed suit. And so you have, at the moment, uh, the, the broadcasting, the, the, um, the, the um, politicians in charge of, of broadcasting, uh, the, the media culture secretaries on, in, both, in both the shadow and... and, and uh, uh, government um, threatening the license fee in one form or another. One wants to to top slice it and hand out the the, the proceeds to other organisations that are not doing so well. Um, and of course, you know who gets to decide how much to top slice the government. Um, the, uh, the the uh, the Conservatives um, uh, making. Extraordinary noises, uh, it seems to me. I mean, deciding which service of the BBC should should continue and which should not. Uh, I, I, you know, it's one of those things that you might have thought might actually be done by the head of the BBC. But no, it seems to be the, 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 the shadow culture secretary who seems to have his ideas about what the BBC will do, what, 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 uh, what its programming will be. This not not happened before. And, uh, the, and it especially hasn't happened that both, both the opposition and, uh, uh, and government uh, uh, have been doing it before. Um, if you mess around with the license fee, you mess around with the BBC's heart and soul. Uh, the evidence for that is an uh, excellent organization which I, I continue to admire, CBC in Canada, um, which was um, reported something actually quite relatively mild which the then conservative, uh, um, not conservative, was a small C prime minister, um, uh, Mulroney, Brian Mulroney, um, took against, took exception to. And he decided uh, that uh, the next um, uh, license fee round, they would, 
they would uh, expect that the CBC would get a greater degree of its income from advertising than in fact was possible, physically possible. So they said, whatever, whatever the figures were, you know, they said, okay, well, we, instead of 32% from advertising of your costs, we, we think you ought to try a bit harder and you get 45 out. And so there was a 12% discrepancy and they continued to do that. CBC continues to be a good and, and um, uh, admirable organization, but it's a, nowadays it's a niche broadcaster. It's a small broadcaster in Canada, broadcast to intelligent, educated people, and it has ceased to be the mass broadcaster to, 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 to Canadians. That job has been taken over by a much more sort of American um, uh, institution, CTV. Um, the same, the same would, the same, I, I suspect, will happen to, to, to the BBC, that it'll, um, it'll be messed, the license fee will be messed around with, the money will drop, the quality, the standards, the scope then drops. At some stage, you get, uh, you get, you have to make the decision, who are we actually broadcasting to? Are we broadcasting to the nation? Or are we broadcasting to the kind of people that most support the BBC and most like it. And you go, you go where your supporters are. I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. I, I mean, it, it would be a very miserable end of my uh, career or my life for me to see the BBC go down the tubes like, in that sort of way. I'm sure there will be a BBC, and I'm sure it will still produce decent programs into the future, assuming that that's what uh, we, we still have, uh, sort of television programs and so on. But I, I don't trust either of the main parties to look after, to protect the BBC as they should. Is this to do with Murdoch's influence? Well, who am I to say? What a shameful, outrageous suggestion, uh, which of course I would be the very first to knock down. Um, and the fact that the director of communications in, uh, in the Conservative Party is the editor of a was the editor of a, of a Murdoch newspaper, is, is purely coincidental. Actually, I think I do mean that. I think I mean it. Um, but I don't like the tone of some of the stuff. I don't like the fact that Sky News uh, executives are now starting to argue very strongly for lifting the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the legal requirement for broadcasters to be balanced. In other words, they're trying to get um, um, uh, Fox News introduced into, into Britain. We've seen the savage uh, effects of, of Fox News on um, the, the nature of political argument and political debate in the, in the United States, how it's sharpened and poisoned the whole debate over a period of time. Um, who can be certain that the same wouldn't happen here? Uh, the lady there. And then I pr perhaps that ought to be the last one. Um, to what extent do you think uh, journalism and writing is writing the history? To what extent do I think journalism is writing history? Um, I, not, not as much as I would like it to be. I mean, and I, I, again, you know, I'm now going back to my, to my uh, sort of authorial uh, voice because... Um, you know, reading over a period of two intensive years, reading, reading, reading uh, uh, journalism, pretty depressing thought, actually. Um, it, it, you realize how ineffably wrong so much of it is by decent people that, you know, thought that they were, they were reporting the right thing. I mean, the, clear, the clearest, most obvious example is uh, the, the outbreak of the, of the First World War when People went walking into it blindfold. Nobody seemed to realize, politicians realized the dangers, but the newspapers didn't. Um, uh, same perhaps with the Second World War, that the, the uh, Beaverbrook uh, insisted that the, um, the, the Daily Express should have under its mar masthead, the Daily Express assures its readers that there will be no war in 1939. Um, you know, this doesn't make for the best kind of history uh, uh, when, you, when you have such mistaken judgments, such misunderstandings of what's happening around you. But 
This is a shock, I know, to many, many, many people, but journalists are only human and no, can see no further, of course, uh, than, than anybody else and um, than the, the rest of society and uh, probably less for, 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 for different reasons and you stumble your way through. It's why I feel such sympathy for my, my colleagues of, of the past because, I mean, I, I you know, I, I've no idea what, what, when I go to a place what's going to happen. Of course, who does? I mean, you know, you, you, you're not, we can't be God. And so historians have a kind of godlike quality because they can make grand judgments about broad sweeps of history. But the poor old hack stuck up there at the front as it's happening, trying to find out what's, with half their mind, trying to find out what's going on. Half the, the rest of their mind is, 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 is focused on how to get it back under often difficult circumstances which haven't got fantastically better since 1900. Um, uh, you know, you still, you've, you've still got to pay attention to these things. And so you, you stumble through the fog uh, in, a, in a dense wood. Uh, you don't know where the way out is, you know, or the hell's happening. You just hope that you can make sense of the little patch where you find yourself. And the people that do that with honesty and decency uh, are the heroes of this book of mine. Um, the ones that knew that they weren't telling the truth, but wrote it anyway, are the, the big villains. My dear friend and mentor, mentoress, Martha Gellhorn, whom I, 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 I miss uh, every time I think of her, which is very often, um, used to say that the only defense of journalism is that it's uh, is when it's um, a, 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 a decent uh, account of what our lives actually are and I, I I think that's that's absolutely right so better than that anybody who makes greater claims for it is a bit of an idiot um, and um, you know but it's all we've got and uh, that's that's its only defense we're all we've got Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>